is the US dollar falling apart? When will the Fed pivot? And uh, are we we're also in Q3 earnings season. What kind of impulses can we expect? All this and more. We'll be chatting with Stephen Hochberg, or Hochberg, he, he pronounces it. Goes a bit against my German roots. And uh, really excited to have him on. He's the chief market analyst over at Elliott Wave International. And uh, they look more at things from a sentiment perspective. Bit of a fresh perspective. I just came back from New Orleans. Did 17 interviews with uh, newsletter writers, panelists, and fantastic keynotes talking about the Fed pivot, the US dollar, and uh, of course, gold and silver precious metals. And uh, really curious to hear his perspective and what the sentiment tells us and uh, what maybe the outlook is as well. But uh, enough of my introduction. I think, Steve, you can s say so much more about yourself that I can. But it's great to have you on and really appreciate your time. Well, it's great to be with you today. Thank you. Yeah, ex exciting times. And also kind of boring times, I have to admit, because we're 13 days away from a Fed meeting. And after, like, I, had to, I have to admit, maybe I'm a bit biased, but I had a really busy week in New Orleans last week talking about the Fed pivot with 17 guests. And uh, it feels like that topic is a bit uh, rotten out. And uh, my first question when I thought about our interview today was really like, where can an impulse come from? Where can we get a bit of excitement in the market? And just really posing that question to you before I get to my thinking, where, where, where can we see an impulse from, and how do we break that sort of boringness? For lack of a term? Well, I mean, it, it's, and from our perspective, it's been anything but boring. It's been very exciting. Uh, and one of the reasons it's been exciting is because we had been looking for a market top. Um, and uh, we looked at a lot of our indicators throughout all of 2021, and um, they were just at historic extremes. Uh, and the patterns that we follow in the market we're coming to a culmination, fruition. Um, and it really started out in February of last year when a lot of these um, uh, you know, YOLO stocks or, or uh, these meme stocks peaked out and started crashing. Uh, and then and that was followed by a peak in the Russell 2000 index in November, along with the NASDAQ 100. And then the Dow and the S&P joined the topping parade in the first few days of this year. Uh, and since then, all these indexes have been down uh, quite a bit, uh, but we, we think there's much more to go on the downside. So from our perspective, we're, we're, we're pretty excited from the sense that we were able to get out in front of what's happening right now. Um, and as we're speaking here in, in, in October, um, the markets are having a little bit of a counter trend rebound uh, going into that Fed meeting that you talked about. But, but uh, to us, it's just a bear market rally. Uh, these are normal. They occur uh, throughout bear markets. We've studied every single major bear market throughout the history of the markets in the US. And what we're seeing right now is just a normal occurrence. And once it exhausts itself, I think that's when we start going back down again. So um, from our perspective, we're, we're pretty excited about the near term, uh, maybe a counter trend rally, and then a resumption of the, uh, of the bear market. Lots to follow up on. I made a couple of notes that you you were just talking about meme stocks. Remind me to get back to that because I have a question in that regard. But uh, sure. let's talk about the Q3 earnings season real quick first because that's happening actually as we speak. Uh, Netflix came out and surprised the market. Tesla came out and sort of uh, like surprised the market to the downside. Um, what, what kind of impulse? Like, are you expecting an impulse from from that aspect as well, or is that just an, a non-event at this point in time? Yeah, it's and it's. The way we look at things, it's, it's basically a non-event most of the time, uh, or really all the time, because what we've found is that earnings lag the stock market. Um, so what you're reporting, what Tesla's reporting or what Netflix is reporting is what they did last quarter. Uh, but the stock market is a forward-looking mechanism, uh, giving uh, a, a window into the psychology of today and what it means tomorrow. Uh, so they're not really reacting to earnings that have occurred last quarter. What they're looking is, is forward. So we don't really focus in on earnings that much because they're just a lagging indicator. Interesting. Okay. I had a good discussion with a friend yesterday over WhatsApp, and uh, he, he's making a ton of money shorting stocks right now, and uh, in particular the car sector. He said if we would have started months ago shorting Carvana, and he mentioned another company I forgot, he wouldn't have to work for the rest of his life, more or less. Like he was exaggerating, hopefully a little bit. But uh, that's a goal for all of us. <laughs> exactly. No, but he, he's actually really good, and like he's been really early on on Peloton shorting. But my point is, like other sectors you're looking at in particular, um, when when you're looking at your trend changes or at your trends, and you know trying to forecast what is going on. Right. Yeah, we look at 
all sectors and, and different uh, possibilities. And you know, we mainly focus in on the broad indexes because we find that so, uh, social psychology or human psychology manifests itself in these broad indexes. But in our last newsletter, which uh, is called the Elliott Wave Financial Forecast, I write that with my uh, partner, Peter Kendall, uh, we focus in particular on the financial sector. And one of the reasons we did so is because the yield curve is inverted right now. Now, a lot of your uh, listeners might understand that, meaning that short-term interest rates on treasuries, like the two-year treasury note, are yielding more than the yield on the 10-year U.S. treasury note. Uh, that's not a normal situation. I mean, that's what we call an inverted yield curve. And what we did was we looked at the financial sector um, back through history, and every time the yield curve, the U.S. yield curve inverted, and financials got hit very hard. Uh, because uh, of their nature of business, um, their margins tend to get squeezed extra hard once the yield curve inverts. So that's one of the sectors that uh, we uh, discussed in our letter. And we said, look, you know, this is not a sector you want to be playing in right now, uh, particularly on the bullish side uh, as the yield curve inverts. And even uh, as the yield curve uninverts, that's when we start to get into some uh, problems not only in just the financial sector, but uh, the economy and the market in general. Yeah, it's like you know, the ten-year Treasury. I just looked at it up, uh, looked it up before our conversation. Four point two percent, or close to four point two percent, which is extremely high. Um, are you recommending to buy bonds right now with that kind of yield at all, or is that just dangerous water? That's why the the yields are going up and uh, mm-hmm. nobody's buying. Yeah. <laughs> so what's interesting from our perspective right now is the. Um, positive cross-correlation of so many disparate markets. Um, And it's something that we saw in 2007 through 2009 also during that bear market. When stocks went down, bonds uh, were under pressure. Uh, During the worst part of that uh, 2007-2009 decline, gold and silver were down. I think gold was down 30% from March of 2008 to October, November. Silver fell even farther, 60%. Um, uh, commodities were down a bit. So uh, to, to our view is that um, when, once these normally disparate markets start moving together, uh, it's showing a lack of liquidity uh, in the market in general. Uh, and when liquidity wanes, uh, you know, everything starts moving down more, not, not you know, exactly, but trending together. Uh, and that's a very worrisome sign, is particularly if you're bullish the market, uh, you have to be very careful. And that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, gold and silver uh, topped out in March of this year. And since about then, they've been trending with the market to the downside. And so that's just, that's a very um, uh, troublesome situation uh, if you're looking to buy something. I think you have to wait till these uh, markets uh, show some uh, more liquidity before, uh, before stepping in and trying to, trying to pick, a, pick a winner here right now. Before we go too far down the macro route, talk precious metals, commodities as well. I just want to circle back real quick to the stock market and talk meme stocks that you brought up. Um, yeah. Last week, I was a bit surprised because I thought it was sort of less off the table was student loan forgiveness. And uh, Biden sort of made a con- concession, said, okay, $20,000 if you were enrolled in, I think it was the Pell program. I forgot, but uh, 20,000 right. for, for X and 10,000 for Y. My right. point is like, I, I, I was in a signal group with some friends and I was like, so what what Bitcoin or what what should we buy, and uh, what meme stocks do we buy, right? Um, do do you see an effect there? Do you see that happening? Because uh, again, it's just like QE for a very limited group of people. Right. Um, you know what's interesting about Bitcoin is it too has been trending with the stock market. Uh, it peaked out in November. Uh, I think it was the exact day that the Russell 2000 index peaked on uh, November 8th of last year, uh, and it's down what 70% since that high. Um, and as stocks have, have moved down and as the NASDAQ has moved down in the, and the Russell 2000. So again, we're in this really rare environment where, um, tr- where disparate assets are starting to trend together. And when they do that, it, it's a signal to us that uh, they're basically moving based on their perception of liquidity. As the liquidity waxes, things start moving up together. And as liquidity wanes, everything starts moving down together. Uh, there's an old saw in the market that says, in times of crisis, all correlations go to plus one. Uh, and that means, very simply, is that when, when, when things start falling apart and markets start moving to the downside, 
Uh, people look to see what they can sell easily, uh, trying to raise cash and getting in safe investments or what they perceive to be safe investments. And it seems to me that's kind of the environment. We're not, we haven't gotten really into it that heavily, but we're, we look like we're moving in that direction. And that's very worrisome uh, if you're invested in stocks, if you're invested in Bitcoin, if you're invested in gold and silver right now, um, to see everything moving together. Because it suggests to us that liquidity is on the wane and these, uh, and these assets are moving to the downside. Uh, the, 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 the flood of liquidity to a very particular smaller group of people, and I'm assuming they're mostly younger, actually, or at the lower end, maybe late 20s, just graduated college. Do you expect that to, to flood the market again? Because I'm not sure everybody no. will need $20,000 or $10,000. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not saying they're, old, they're, they're rich or like well, well ado here, but uh, that's extra capital or extra money that nobody really planned with. And uh, do you see that YOLO culture coming back? Yeah. Uh, I think it will try. Um, <laughs> You know, the buy the dip, the buy the dip mentality is alive and well in the market, which is another signal on the way we look at things that suggests we're not even close to being near a bottom, because bottoms in stocks are not made when 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 investors are looking to buy. Uh, bottoms are made when investors are looking to sell, when they're fearful, when every little move up in the market, they're ready to dump their investments and get out and get into cash and find some sort of safety. That's when you know psychology has moved uh, or is getting to a point where you're going to you can start looking for a stock market low. Right now, we still have people looking to buy the dip, and as long as people look to buy the dip, it's a pretty clear signal to us that we're not at a at, at a bottom in the market or or in these other assets. Yeah, it's like one one point that came up in conversation a couple times last week as well. There's no fear yet in the market. There's no run for the door. People are not trying to exit quickly. Yes, some of the tech stocks are down, but uh, there's no, as you said, like there's no panic, like, right? And and that's right. that's an that's an excellent point. Uh, and in, and because there's no panic, it tells you that we're not we're not there yet. Um, you know, I, I lived through the crash of '87. I, you might have also, and I was there through the dot com mania. You know, the bursting of the bubble in 2000, 2002, and and uh, we were we all experienced the great credit crisis of 2007, 2009. I remember right near the low in 2009, the Wall Street Journal ran a headline, and we still have that headline saved, and we published it in our newsletter. It said, how low can the market go? In other words, a big question. They, they weren't looking to the upside. They weren't looking to buy the dip. All they were looking was, how bad is it going to get? And once that psychology starts to come to fruition, to the forefront, then you know you're at closer to a low than you are when, pe when, the, when there is no fear and people are still trying to buy the dip. No, that makes sense. And uh, maybe, maybe changing gears just a little bit. Midterm elections are coming up. Uh, we're about 18 days away from them, uh, November 8th. What kind of impulses do you expect from that event? Because it seems like there's a lot of pol pol uh, policies, a lot of policies are driven by the midterm elections. We have more oil being issued uh, out of the SPR, the, the Strategic Petroleum Reserves in the US. We have the student loan forgiveness that we talked about just now. What, what other impulses do you expect and uh, especially what happens the day after? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is we've done studies on uh, being able to predict uh, the election based on the position of the stock market. Uh, we published one uh, pretty famous uh, study uh, that was peer reviewed, looking, trying to predict who's going to remain in power based on the position of where stocks are. Um, I, I think the policies that emanate are simply going to be a result of uh, social psychological forces that are in play right now. So as, as the market goes down and people get more pessimistic and more bearish, um, less things are going to be able to be accomplished through uh, or, or, or less legislation is going to be able to be passed uh, in Congress uh, and in the state houses. So um, whatever uh, comes out of, the, of, of Congress right now, uh, I think is going to be viewed through the prism and the lens of where we are within uh, the, the movement toward a pessimistic extreme as the market goes down. And uh, the odds of anything getting done or getting passed are very minuscule, particularly if we're correct on the market. Now, if the market starts flying right here, well, you're gonna get tons of legis legislation uh, being passed and, and, uh, and, and people will be more optimistic, but I don't think we're wrong at this point. So I think, I, I don't think the government, uh, I think the government is, is behind the curve and is simply uh, moving uh, according to the whims of psychology and social mood and the public in general. 
Um, and now let's speculate a little bit, and it's a bit of a controversial question I'm going to ask next. I think is um, I'm, I'm looking at the Fed Watch tool here, and uh, they have the, the Fed raising another 75 basis points at about 77 percent, which I find extremely high for for December 14th. A, we are behind after the midterm uh, midterm elections, but also everybody predicts a, a 4.5 percent sort of rate target, right? How does that fit together? Well, this is another study that we've done uh, throughout the year, uh, throughout the, our years uh, publishing. And, and, and what we found was really interesting is the Fed simply follows the market. Uh, the Fed, you know, uh, short term, three month and six month. If you want to know what the Fed's doing, just look at the three month T-bill, look at the six month T-bill, and they're going to basically align their Fed funds rate with whatever the three and six month bill are at this point. Um, so they simply they simply follow the market as Three month and six month bills rise. The Fed may lag a bit, um, but they're eventually going to move their Fed funds rate in line to whatever freely traded interest rates are doing. Uh, so, uh, to us, it's not whether they they go up seventy five basis points or hundred basis. I mean, to that's in the long run, it's it really doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Um, all they're going to do is validate what the market wants them to do. Right now, the market is raising interest rates. Yields are going up. The Fed's going to follow all the way until they get as high as the market gets. And then when the market peaks out and yields start to come down, the Fed will eventually pause. So that's kind of how our view of what's going on uh, plays out here. I don't think the actual level of interest rate really matters that much, whether it's 3% or 3.25% or 5%, uh, the market will determine where, where the Fed's going to go in the future. Of course, like we're in the precious metals space, so always we have to talk a bit of doom and gloom and look for cracks in the system. Um, what are some of the indicators you're looking for, let's say, when it comes to a Fed pivot or even the DXY US dollar breaking down? Yeah, the dollar is interesting. I mean, the dollar has been on a tear since January of 2021. January, I think, six was the was the low point. And we've been tracking what we call an, an impulse, an Elliott wave that's been unfolding since January. Um, and we spiked up uh, recently. And I think the dollar probably needs another upward push to complete its impulse wave, but we're watching the short-term movements very closely. One thing we did note um, is that recently uh, there was a magazine cover that came out showing a very strong dollar, um, uh, telling how it's, it's wrecking the other currencies and it's never going to stop rising. Well, to us, that's a pretty good sentiment signal. We call it the magazine cover indicator which was uh, formulated by uh, an analyst named Paul McCray Montgomery. And basically he said that uh, whenever a uh, financial asset uh, makes its way to the front page of a popular magazine- Probably Barron's, eh? (laughs) Yeah, like Time or Newsweek he was looking. uh, (laughs) Usually you're you're near the end of that psychology, that that trend, that trend's near exhaustion and ready to reverse. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, the dollar was on the cover of, uh, I think it was Bloomberg Business Week. Now that is a- that is a financial publication, so to speak, but uh, I thought that was a pretty good signal that we're probably closer to the end of the dollar's rise than we are in the middle of it. Really good point, because like before we hit record here, I asked you like one, one thing I want to talk about is, is the US dollar losing steam? Because I looked at the last month, just uh, quickly here on Google Finance, and it looks like the, the, the dollar index, the DXY dollar index sort of flat, like flatlined the last month and sort of ran out of steam. It even broke down to at a, at a point in about two weeks ago, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about liquidity in a second. But then all of a sudden, everything went up, went up pretty much because everybody expected a Fed pivot. But uh, before we get distracted talking liquidity, U.S. dollar is it really losing steam? Like, what, what's the sentiment saying? You, you said like, okay, it seems top heavy based on the news reporting, but uh, is is that an indicator? DXY losing, running out of steam last month, sort of flat. Yeah, I mean, it looks like we're in the what we call the fifth wave. The fifth wave is an ending wave in terms of the model that we use. Uh, now, I'm not sure that fifth wave is over just quite yet. Uh, I think if we close below 110, you pretty much can say, yeah, the dollar has made a high and it's in a, a, a downward move, a, a downward correction. Uh, but as, as we see it right now, it looks like it needs a, another push to a, a new high before it completes this structure that we're following, this model that uh, gives us a little peek into what's happening in the future. But in terms of the peak momentum, yeah, the peak momentum in the dollars rally is definitely passed in our estimation. And now we're in the kind of the cleanup phase, the ending phase of this rally that started in January of 2021. Interesting. Do you have a, do your indicators 
tell you where the level is, the top level, like where it needs to hit? Is is there? Yeah. I'm not a technical analyst, but I find it interesting. And uh, maybe you hold accountable. So when we chat again, you know, like, oh, you said <laughs> yes. the dollar would go to 120 uh, or the DXY would go to 120 points. Um, is that sort of what we're looking at? Is that where a technical level sits? Yeah, right now, all we can say with, with, with a degree of confidence is that it should make a new high above 114, whatever the, the previous high was. Um, uh, but we have to follow the short term waves in order to hone in on the exact level. Uh, so I don't have a, a strong upside target right now, but just the way the pattern has emerged, looks like we'll make a new high above 114. Uh, and that would complete that cycle, that five wave pattern from uh, January 2021 and turn us into a, a trend reversal and a decline in the Dow that should be the sharpest since 2021. Um, and again, we're looking at about the 110 level as a, as a key level uh, to maintain. If, and if we start closing below that, we might have to uh, uh, change our view on the dollar and say, okay, that, that was it. Uh, that 114 and change high was, was the top and now we're, uh, and now we're going down. Stephen, I need to flip a coin now because I have two ways I want to take this conversation now. One is the geopolitical way, talk about how Saudi Arabia is influencing the US dollar, or we talk liquidity and talk about what happened about two weeks ago. When the, uh, I, I, Let's start geopolitically. I want to talk because the liquidity sort of leads to precious metals later on. Um, Saudi Arabia mentioned they want to join the BRICS. It seems like they're flipping publicly the US off and... Uh, it seems like the market expects some other countries and the OPEC maybe leave the petrodollar system or are looking for alternatives for the petrodollar. Um, how is that weighing on the DXY and or on the US dollar? And how does that fit into the overall narrative? Yeah, I, I don't think it's weighing that much on the dollar. I think the dollar moves based on uh, the the uh, internal uh, uh, psychology that, that, that uh, investors have when they look at assets. And I don't think they uh, trade off the news. I mean, the way we look at it is a little different. The, the news that you read, the news headlines that you read uh, are uh, the results of, so, of social psychological forces that have already occurred. In other words, uh, mood uh, motivates people to take action. And it's the mood that we're looking at because the mood comes first and the actions come later. So the, the, the news headlines today are simply results of, of mood that has already occurred. So I think that when people are getting bullish the dollar as it's rallying, they're simply getting bullish the dollar. They're simply getting more optimistic because the price is rising and they're not really, uh, they're not really, I mean, they'll, they'll, point to, um, they'll point to Saudi Arabia or they'll point to maybe what Biden's doing with the strategic uh, petroleum reserves. They'll point to some fundamental that they think is moving the market. But really what's moving the market is simply in internal psychology among investors who aren't sure what's going on and are hurting and looking to their neighbor and creating these patterns of optimism and pessimism. So I, I don't think that uh, Saudi Arabian uh, action is going to really affect the dollar itself. I think the dollar is going to do what it's going to do. Saudi Arabia is going to do what it's going to do. And once that optimism reaches its peak in the U.S. dollar, probably with a new high above Warren 14, uh, that will complete this pattern, this this model that we use, and then it will be time to reverse. Whether Saudi Arabia does something or someone else does something in the world, yeah. So Saudi Arabia sounds a bit like a mood dampener to me, to be honest, based on what yeah. I'm reading here in Germany, right? Um, no, fantastic, Stephen. Great answer to that. Um, let's talk about liquidity real quick, and also precious metals. How it's that? How that's affecting? Um, one number I've been hearing a number of times lately as well is that there's five trillion dollars sitting on the sideline to come back into the market. I have not verified that number. It might be complete bogus. Um, but my indicator, like proof of concept that there is money waiting to be deployed, it was, was about two weeks ago when the DXY broke down to 110 because the Bank of England sort of had to pivot, meaning, okay, they had to bail out the pension funds and pump liquidity into the system. So what do, what do you make of that situation? Was that a proof of concept that when the Fed pivots, when the market breaks down, is is that what we can expect? Like. Yeah, I don't know. Is there you know, liquidity? Is there like five trillion dollars sitting on the sideline? Uh, no, because uh, because in, because if you if you buy something, someone has to sell something. So the market the market is not uh, it, it's a zero sum game. So uh, so if I'm buying a hundred shares of of IBM, someone else is selling a hundred shares of IBM, and all that's really happening is that that money that Jello on the plate is just getting moved around. So money doesn't. 
I don't, I don't think uh, the concept of money on the sidelines to us is, is, is not quite uh, in our way of thinking on this. It's just, it's, just, it's just who owns what asset at one time, because in order to buy an asset, someone has to sell it. In order to sell an asset, someone has to buy it. Um, so uh, I don't think there's, th th there's this you know, rush of money that's just waiting to buy, buy the market. I think you know, people have their money where, they're have it, where they have it. And as the market goes down further, which we think it will do, uh, that money's going to disappear. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go poof because uh, the value of what they were holding is going to go down. Okay, no, it makes a lot of sense. It's like I could because I couldn't find any verification for it. I haven't looked too hard, but it just sounds like somebody made up an argument to to to, to work on their or with their thesis, right? Yeah. Um, but let's talk quickly. You mentioned it already briefly: um, precious metals, gold and silver. Um, what is your outlook there? Well, you know, uh, it could get to a point where it's so bad it's good. I mean, silver is silver was fifty dollars an ounce in two thousand eleven. It's now nineteen dollars. Uh, it's down what sixty percent over the last eleven years. I can't think of a worst investment in the entire universe of investments than silver has been over the last eleven years. Now that doesn't mean the next eleven years are going to be exactly like the last eleven years. In fact, we can pretty much guarantee they're not going to be. Things change. No trend is forever. But but, but silver has, has been a, just a horrid investment. Uh, and the question is, you know, when does that change? When does the the downward move, this downward wave complete itself. Um, you know, and gold, it really hasn't been that much, you know, gold's trading at the same level as it was in, in August, 2011 right now. It went, you know, went down to 2015 or so, then it rallied to a new high and now it's back down. Um, so it's really gone nowhere over this past 11 years also. The, the thing with us is, is, is the next wave down in the, in the bear market in stocks is likely to coincide with a decline in a lot of assets, a lot of disparate assets you would think uh, might have been a safe haven or so forth. And people are just going to be start selling indiscriminately, trying to raise cash and get and get safe. And I think gold and silver, uh, much like they did in uh, 2007, 2009, when they really went down with the stock market are also going to go down with the stock market, at least in the next middle portion of the decline. Now, once things start washing out a bit, um, you might see uh, some people move into gold and silver, trying to uh, uh, hedge a little bit uh, and, and try to find some safety uh, in, a, in an environment where things are just going down uh, helter skelter. Um, but we're not there yet. So what I would say is um, if, you're, if you're super bullish gold and silver, uh, and, and we do consider ourselves long-term gold bulls, because I think gold is real money. Uh, throughout history, it's been real money. And, and people should probably own some of it, a small portion in their portfolio in case things just go nuts in the world. Uh, but as an investment, a major investment or as a trading vehicle, I don't think we're there at a bottom just yet. So we're, we're not bullish gold and silver at this point, but we can see a point down the road, particularly after the stock market starts washing out a bit where we can get very, very more cons uh, constructive both both of those metals. I'm still trying to put a narrative, and let's use that as the last question sort of to end our discussion, which has been really comprehensive, is really put a narrative around what happened two weeks ago. When the market, when the Bank of England, I mentioned that earlier, when the Bank of England came out, okay, we have to bail out the pension funds, we have to pump liquidity into the system. Gold went up 100 bucks, silver went up $3, DXY went down four points. Like, j j just put a narrative around it that makes sense and... Uh, is it that proof of concept? Yeah, I think you know you're going to get short-term pops uh, along the way as the market goes down. Uh, but um, you know we've been uh, the world has been creating uh, or has been monetizing debt now for what since the crisis of 2007 2009, and uh, you know gold and silver really haven't done anything. I mean they 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 made their high in August of 2020. Gold did. Uh, it's down what 30% since then. Uh, silver's down even more than that. So uh, you know, with 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 the world's greatest monetization of debt, both precious metals really haven't uh, moved to the upside that that much. Which which to, to us is a signal that um, the the downtrend's not complete. So um, you know, trying to put this uh, into a, an overall view, I just think that the key for the next. Uh, year to two years is the U.S. stock market. 
I think everything flows from that. And, and, and if we're correct and stocks are still in a bear market and that they have a, a ways to go on the downside, I think a lot of assets uh, are going to come under uh, huge downward pressure in, 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 in their value, real estate, gold, silver, uh, commodities less so simply because they've already had a huge bear market and commodities relative to, the, to stock market is probably going to hold up a little bit better, but they'll still be under some pressure. Oil will be under pressure. Um, and once we get kind of that fear that we talked about earlier in our conversation where people get really scared and they start dumping things left and right, then I think we can start looking at some of these things like gold and silver and, and, and a little bit more allocation maybe to commodities and things of this nature. But we're not there yet. And our, our, our recommendation to all of our readers is be safe. Over the next one to two years, just find something that you can be safe in whether it's a short-term cash. You know, if you're parked in a three-month T-bill, you're actually earning more than the U.S. stock market because the market's going down. It's, you know, the, the S&P's down to what, 20%. So your cash is going up in value relative to a declining asset. So just be safe for the next one or two years, uh, and then we'll see how the market flushes out. And I think there'll be some really good opportunities to step in and buy things for cents on the dollar. Fantastic. Stephen, this is probably the most information dense conversation I've had on SF Live here. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Where can we find more of you? Where can we send our uh, viewers? And uh, you have a Twitter account as well, I think. Uh, our office does. Uh, you can find us on uh, www.elliotwave.com. Elliot Wave is one word, and there's two L's and two T's in Elliot. So it's elliotwave.com. Come to our website. We have a ton of free material. Uh, videos, we explain what the wave principle is, and then you can read up on our products and uh, see if it makes sense and you want to follow us. Fantastic. Love the conversation. Really appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much. We'll have to have you back on very soon. Thanks. Appreciate Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. We, I hope you enjoyed the conversation here with Stephen Hotchberg of uh, Elliott Wave, uh, Chief, Chief Market Strategist or Analyst there. Follow us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, hit that like and subscribe button, leave a comment. We want to hear from you and share the video with your friends. Thank you so much and we'll be back with lots more.